What is up, YouTube? Matt McKeever here. Hope you guys are having a good Tuesday. It's been about a week since we did live. Hope you guys uh, uh, were looking forward to this one. I'm really looking forward to jumping into why so many billionaires seem to be buying farmland. But before we get into the specifics, jump in the comment section. Let me know if you guys can hear and see us and uh, that we've got everything set up well. But before we even jump into Bill Gates being the largest individual farmland owner or talking about maybe companies like BlackRock or Blackstone or billionaires like Jeff Bezos that also actually own a decent amount or control a decent amount of farmland. But before we even get into exploring that and whether we as individual investors potentially could benefit from this knowledge as well, should we be looking at farmland? Should we be looking at alternative assets in general, which is that's sometimes what farmland's grouped as, right? Like pieces of fine art, even like some crypto products or NFTs these days as well as farmland often get grouped into alternative assets because they don't necessarily fall under uh, normal real estate, you know, residential or commercial or industrial real estate. And they're obviously not an equity or um, a loan or any sort of a uh, debt facility like that. But anyways, before we jump into it, I want to give you guys a, uh, I guess some context, Bill Gates, by the time we're done this video, maybe you will love Bill Gates. Maybe you will hate Bill Gates. Uh, I'm really interested in Bill Gates. I think he's been a very passionate and aggressive uh, businessman, done very well for himself, obviously. And, you know, there's a quote that's attributed to Bill Gates that has absolutely changed my life. And that's that people underestimate or people overestimate what they can accomplish in one year and underestimate what they can accomplish in 10 years. And that quote literally has changed my life. And in fact, probably one of my biggest regrets is it hasn't even impacted my life more, that I didn't embrace that quote the first time I heard it and really lean into it. Because when you start really thinking long term, it's really interesting how your approach to just about everything evolves. And far too often, people are thinking very short term, in my opinion, chasing today's profits rather than long term legacy or long term impact. Um, but and, you know, a lot of the sources we're going to go through today as well. Uh, they're all biased. I'll try and point out their individual biases as we go through them. But again, just remember, everyone's biased probably myself included. Um, now, when we're thinking about investing in real estate or investing in land or why maybe billionaires invest in real estate and land specifically as well, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind is that uh, Andrew Carnegie quote, right? That 90% of millionaires are made through real estate. Now, to the best of my knowledge, that was said a really long time ago because Carnegie lived a long time ago. And secondly, there's actually no facts that I believe back that up. I don't think anyone's ever actually done a survey or a study that proves that 90% or more of millionaires were created through real estate. However, it's one of those truisms that feels right. And so I think a lot of us understand the concept that, yeah, it, it probably makes sense that you can do well in real estate. And we'll explore how farmland has done compared to the stock market um, later in this episode. We'll compare how it's done versus other asset classes as well. And you probably will come to the conclusion that, yeah, it seems like that works out pretty well. And in addition, I want to give this uh, Henry Kissinger quote. Um, so if you control the oil, you control the country. If you control the food, you control the population. And I just want you to kind of keep that in mind as we explore farmland and why billionaires potentially own that as well. Um, but let's jump into it. So again, I'm not hating on landlords by any stretch of the imagination. In case this is your first time on my YouTube channel, I'm a real estate investor and landlord myself. In fact, the vast majority of my assets and income are still associated with real estate or real estate adjacent businesses. So not hating on the concept of investing in real estate whatsoever as we explore this. But I thought let's start off with, you know, a historical definition of what or of where landlord or the term landlord came from. And again, this will come up later, um, the whole feudal system. But the concept of a landlord may be uh, traced back to the feudal system of uh, manoralism. Uh, where a landed estate is owned by a lord of the manor and usually members of the lower nobility, which uh, come to form the rank of knights in the high medieval uh, period, holding their uh, fief, fief. I once uh, won like one of those uh, word competitions because I knew what that word meant. Um, but uh, fief via uh, sub-infudation. Sub um, but in some cases, the land may also be directly subjected to a member of higher nobility, as in the royal domain, directly owned by a king or in the Holy Roman Empire imperial villagers or villages directly subject to the emperor. And the medieval system ultimately continues the system of villas and uh, lac fundia, we definitely pronounced that wrong, but peasant work broad farmsteads of the Roman Empire. So 
the whole concept of controlling land and that giving you power, not necessarily a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. And again, it turns out as long as you've got the might to be able to enforce those property rights, it usually does work out as a strong investment uh, for investors that, again, as long as you can enforce that property right, the moment that you can't protect your land, the moment you can't keep others from taking it from you or taking your life, then you really lose a lot of that power. But the first article I want to explore with you guys here is from The Guardian. And uh, the headline reads, 1% of farms operate 70% of the world's farmlands or farmland. And so essentially, 1% of the world's farms operate 70% of crop fields, ranches, and orchards, according to a report that highlights the impact of land inequality on the climate and nature crisis. So since the 1980s, researchers found control over the land has become far more concentrated, both directly through ownership and indirectly through contract farming, which results in more destructive monocultures and fewer uh, careful tended small holdings. Now, taking the rising value of property and the growth of uh, landless populations into account for the first time, the report calculates that land inequality is 41% higher than previously believed. So when we're looking at, you know, where are most of the small farmers, where are most of the big farmers, it turns out that landlessness was lowest in China and Vietnam and highest in Latin America, where the poorest 50% of people own just 1% of the land. Asia and Africa have the highest levels of small holdings where human input tends to be higher than chemical and mechanical factors, and where time frames are more likely to be for generations rather than 10-year investment cycles worldwide between 80 and 90% of farms are family or smallholder owned, but they cover only a small and shrinking part of the land and commercial production. And as we go throughout this, I'm going to share some of my personal experience as well. So I grew up on a farm, uh, you know, what we would call here in Canada a century farm, right? So it's been in the family for over a century, 200 acres of land. And one of the things that was really distilled into me growing up was they're not making more land. And if you grew up on a farm, you definitely heard your dad or your mom say that to you at some point in time. Um, but going on a little bit deeper into exactly why or how much of the ultra wealthy are investing in farmland, we've got this great article from uh, Axios, uh, the website Axios, and it says uh, why it matters. The wealthy are often buying the land from asset rich, cash poor, small farmers whose families have owned the land for decades. The purchases put money in the farmer's pockets as many struggle with tough times, but are shifting the structure of land ownership in the American West. And so this is a big, complicated thing to explore as well, because there's a lot of interesting unintended consequences. But if you grew up on a small family farm like I did, you'll know that that concept of being asset rich and cash poor is very common and prevalent. One, because a lot of farmers are very risk adverse, very debt adverse, especially if they came up through the 80s and 90s and were able to hold on to their land holdings as interest rates just skyrocketed. It destroyed a lot of small family farms. Um, and it's a lot easier for really large institutions to get access to money compared to a small independent farmer. And just keep that in your back of your mind as we explore all this as well. Um, but in addition to that, it, there's just certain scales of efficiency that that small independent operator will struggle against large corporations that are um, you know, able to roll out those massive operations. So when we're looking at Africa or China, where there's a lot more manual input, that's why we see a lot more smaller holders of land, right? Simply because you right now it doesn't lend itself easy to the infrastructure of massive operations. Um, but presumably that will change with time. So the big picture here, compared to other luxury assets, land can be enjoyed without losing its value. I think this is a really big factor to understand. When we're talking about other things like maybe, you know, um, uh, jewelry, when we're talking about like vehicles or art or a lot of the other asset classes in there, sometimes they depreciate. Sometimes it's easy for us to lower the value by simply using it or accessing it. And oftentimes those asset classes, unless you're in complicated kind of insurance schemes, um, you're not able to really tap into that value that easily. Now, when we get into really expensive assets, like really fine art, you might be able to borrow against it. Um, but for a lot of the ultra wealthy, but not super ultra wealthy, you know, land is very attractive, farmland in particular, simply because it's a productive asset that really protects or hedges itself against inflation and you know traditionally does pretty well overall. So when we're looking at what's going on in the US, 100 families own about 42 million acres across the country. The amount of land owned by these families has jumped 50% since 2007, reports the, time, or the New York Times. 
the buyers, Amazon, uh, Amazon's Jeff Bezos owns 420,000 acres in Texas. He uses it for his space exploration ventures. Per Bloomberg, he spent his childhood summers at his grandparents' Texas ranch. And uh, businessman John Malone owns the most land in the U.S. with 2.2 uh, million acres. Most of it is ranch land. And media giant Ted Turner owns 2 million acres spread across Montana, Nebraska, and other states. And uh, again, it's fascinating as you just dive deeper into this. But one other perspective I just want to share is it's not just American billionaires that are buying American farmland or farmland in general as well. But uh, 30 million acres of U.S. farmland are held by foreign investors. And that number has doubled in the past two decades, which is uh, raising alarm bells in farming communities. Again, as these small farmers struggle to compete against these really large operators, um, you know, it it really does spread throughout the entire community. I can speak on a first-hand basis about that. Um, but let's move into why this title was about Bill Gates. So again, just a quick reminder, in case you didn't know, Bill Gates regularly near the top of the richest people in the world's list. And uh, his real-time net worth here, according to Forbes, about $128.8 billion, give or take. Most of us would be doing really well if we just had the give or take on that dollar amount. We don't even need the 128.8. But, uh, you know, this year, there's been a lot of news articles um, kind of flooding mainstream media about how Bill Gates is the largest uh, individual farmland owner, right? So not like ranch owner or just landowner, but farmland owner. Um, and this all really relates to his uh, investment uh, company called Cascade Investments. And so we're going to kind of dump, jump into the history here of Cascade Investments, and then we'll get a little bit more into why maybe Bill Gates and other billionaires are investing in this. So the year is 1994, enter Cascade Investments, LLC. And this is from farmlandriches.com. So again, this is from a farm source. They're probably going to be slightly biased towards uh, Bill Gates and him gobbling up all the farmland. But Microsoft has seen almost a decade in 1994 of continual major success since Microsoft's IPO in 1985. The 80s were a massive boon with Microsoft growing over 30% during its first four years public and continued to expand by around 15% until Gates made his exit, uh, his next big move, Cascade Investments, LLC. So in 1994, Bill Gates opened up his family office, Cascade Investments, LLC, with trusted wealth manager uh, Michael Larson. For the foreseeable future, Gates would sell portions of his personal stake in Microsoft stock each year and reinvest it through Cascade Investments. So then jumping into where really farmland comes into play when we're talking about Cascade Investments. So um, first of all, farmland, as I mentioned, it's known as an alternative asset an investment that can grow wealth outside of the stock market. There are many building or budding markets for alternative assets like real estate, fine art, foreign stocks, cryptocurrencies, even NFTs. Uh, but where farmland differs from a lot of those alternative assets, is that because it's such a crucial human resource, I mean, food equals humans, and less than desirable economic situations, farmland tends to appreciate even further in value as opposed to losing value, i.e. during like a dreaded stock market crash, right? Or as we go into recessions or uh, depressions. Um, because of this crucial factor inherent to farmland, it also tends to provide better consistent returns during times when inflation rises. And this is something that definitely since the 70s, we've seen across North America, right? It's just the, you know, my dad tells a story about how a neighbor's farm came up. I think I want to say it was in the seventies. Maybe it was, uh, yeah, it must've been like late seventies. And anyways, um, a neighboring farm came up. It was a hundred acres. We already owned 200 acres and he was looking at, it, it was $30,000 to buy this farm. And he was sitting there thinking about it. He's like, I, I don't know. You know, what do I need with another 100 acres? I can live off of 200 acres and $30,000 is a lot of money. Well, if you know anything about farmland prices in southwestern Ontario, you know, if we fast forward to the present day, about 50 years later, uh, maybe 45 years later, it that land now is worth 20,000 an acre. That means that it would be worth like $2 million. $30,000 to $2 million in half a century. That's pretty crazy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people see it as a natural hedge against inflation. Um, but also because you're investing in the land itself, your investment not only is quite resistant to depreciation, but also provides some solid tax benefits due, uh, um, due to land ownership. Uh, you're not investing in a building that will decay over time, but the rich farmland itself. And if that farmland is managed correctly, it, it's not really going to depreciate in value in any way, right? It, it's useful life can continue if you're managing the land and the nutrients um, effectively. 
And so what also um, that needs to be taken in consideration is there's lots of um, tax benefits potentially to farmers. There's lots of programs and subsidies. Again, oftentimes larger operators are able to better position themselves to take advantage of those opportunities. And when we're looking at farmland, there are some downsides or built-in drawbacks when we're thinking about it. And so farmlandriches.com breaks it out for us here. Farmland requires a paid tenant, a team of farmers to work the land in order to create revenue. And in fact, if you let that land go uh, fallow, if you just let it kind of sit dormant, it actually will lose value. But as long as someone's actively managing it and managing it appropriately, it will maintain or increase in value and can continue being productive for you know, decades to come. Um, vacancies can uh, create periods without return. Again, if you don't have tenants, you won't make money. Whether natural disasters can have an impact, right? And potentially climate change long-term could have an impact on certain parcels of uh, farmland as well. And American farmland produces a lot of exports and as foreign relations sour, more tariffs on produce can become uh, likely hurting your return. So there's, you know, you're exposed to the uh, food commodity market, right? So that can be very, uh, look into trained commodities if you want to understand the volatility there. But farmland has some of the lowest liquidity among assets. So again, that high price point um, means that not everyone can just go in and buy it, right? Very few uh, people these days buy farmland in cash because of the crazy price, it's 20,000 an acre. Um, growing up as a kid, I would have never imagined that. I can remember talking to my buddies and being like, do you think farmland will get to $10,000 an acre? It, it definitely did, and then some. Um, but moving on here then to just an article in Vox, um, which just kind of highlighted some of the perspectives in regards to what's going on with these really large operators. Um, one Georgia farmer, again, this guy's likely gonna be biased, an environmental advocate, uh, John Quarterman told NBC that while he expected the, that Gates would encourage more sustainable practices after buying farmland nearby, his acquisition of that land didn't change much. And that the National Farmers Union has suggested that the growing number of non-farmer owners like Gates buying up farmland and renting it out could lead to practices that hurt the environment. Short-term farmers or tenant farmers may not be as motivated to want to make sure that they're managing the land responsibly. Uh, who rent land are less likely to take long-term conservation steps. The organization argues and non-farmer owners don't have the experience to understand the importance of protecting natural resources. On the other hand though, others have floated out the opposite idea that Gates' massive investment in farmland might have a direct relationship to his other climate efforts. Uh, Newsweek, for instance, recently suggested his land ownership may be connected to his investments in climate change, agricultural developments, and impossible foods, though it didn't offer much support for that premise. Um, and then as we move on, uh, Financial Samurai, uh, I've been a long reader of his uh, blog, um, you know, pre-YouTube and all that. Uh, one, I just thought this was a great graphic, so we'll look at it in a second. But in January of 2021, the land report broke the news that Bill and Melinda Gates are now the largest private owners of U.S. farmland. The two own 242,000 acres of farmland uh, through their investment manager, uh, Cascade Investments LLC. This puts the Gates ahead of the second largest owner of farmland, the uh, Offit family, by over 50,000 acres. And so this is just a breakdown of where the Gates actually own their farmland. So I found this interesting to um, really explore as well, just to see, you know, it. it's just interesting to me that, you know, um, Washington, Nebraska, uh, Florida all have high and Arizona, but then when we look right here, right, Louisiana and Arkansas, there's huge chunks there. And in fact, I think we'll explore this later, but if you didn't realize it, oh, actually, yeah, it's right here, perfect. Um, so. Cascade Investments buying up farmland. Cascade Investments, B Bill Melinda Gates investment arm, has been buying up U.S. farmland for almost a decade. In 2014, according to the Wall Street Journal, the fund owned at least 100,000 acres of farmland in California, Illinois, uh, Iowa, Louisiana, and other states. And Cascade's single largest investment was made in 2017 when the fund acquired $520 million uh, of farmland assets from the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. A major Canadian pension fund, this collection of holdings which accounts for the majority of Cascade's farmland acreage today, was previously owned by the Agricultural Company of uh, America, AgCoA. And at the time, AgCoA was acquired by uh, CPPIB in 2013. It was one of the leading institutional investors in row crop farmland in the United States. In fact, um, I don't know if this holds true after this transaction, but prior to that transaction, Canadians were the largest uh, holders, Canadians and Canadian corporations were the largest holders um, non-American holders of American farmland. Uh, so 
looking at why is Bill Gates buying up so much farmland, um, you know, Financial Samurai pointed out this farmland investing benefit. Number one, strong historical returns. First and foremost, U.S. farmland offers solid returns. Between 1992 and 2020, farmland offered an average annual return of 11 percent. This compares favorably to an average annual return of 8 percent from the stock market. And, you know, if you go earlier in 1992, it was pretty volatile for uh, uh, stocks, bonds and farmland. But that's a pretty good chunk of time. That's 30 years to be looking at that time horizon. And if you guys want to dive deeper into it, there's lots of great breakdowns here uh, that Sam did for us. But looking at his point number four, farmland investing benefit, number four, low volatility. So fourth, farmland is an extremely low volatility asset class. As shown in the chart above, stock market volatility was 17.2% between 1992 and 2020. In contrast, the volatility of U.S. farmland was only 6.9%. Um, and again, this is a lengthy article with uh, lots of comments. Feel free to jump over and check it out yourself. Um, oh, it looks like I must have timed out here. But uh, Bloomberg also had an article about how Jeff Bezos um, had a had uh, essentially acquired a stake in, oh, I forget the name of the company now, but affordable food or something like that. But essentially he was a uh, initial investor in a company that was looking to acquire a lot of farmland. And he also controls a lot of farmland and U.S. land himself. Um, moving on to Forbes, they had this article. Again, this isn't a new topic per se. This one's from 2021, but some of the articles we've been discussing here are 2017, 2019, 2021. So rich people buying farmland, not a new idea, um, but it's definitely really got into the general population, the, um, the collective consciousness because of those mainstream news articles that were discussing Bill Gates' uh, his recent acquisition. So as it stands, non-accredited investors, individuals who make less than 200,000 annually and have a net worth of less than 1 million cannot invest in the real estate that uh, defines our cities. While it is possible to invest in a real estate investment trust uh, that owns commercial multifamily investment properties, there is no easy way to build a community of investors around that aligned values of specific owners, developers, and financiers. And so the only reason I really wanted to explore this with you guys is highlighting the fact that, again, for like billionaires or people that are constantly dealing in large sums of money, it's a lot easier the closer you are to the printing press or to the big banks or the central banks to be able to get access to that cheap debt. And it's just so much easier for the big investors, big institutions or billionaires to be able to navigate that space compared to your small, local, little independent farmer. They're going to be viewed as a much greater risk from a bank's perspective than this huge conglomerate that has lots of other assets they can put up um, it, it can put up. And again, when we're looking at, you know, just even small groups of investors wanting to pool together to acquire farmland, we get into a bunch of restrictions the moment you start to have too many partners, right? So here in Canada, you know, you're probably going to end up having to get a T5013 or set up a corporation if you guys want to start acquiring um, real estate together. And again, you won't be able to solicit or solicit um, from the general public investment into your corporation. So again, you'd have to build out an an entity that's allowed to be, you know, legally shilled to the general public. So like a publicly traded company. So again, there's some, you know, I think below the surface barriers that a lot of people don't take into consideration and thinking about why is so much land accumulating in the handful of a few. And then I guess building upon this, I'm going to try and not go down too far of a rabbit hole, although it seems like I've got a lot of tabs open. So I'm going to try and fire through this fast. But if you didn't realize it, you know, Bill Gates and his um, interest in agriculture doesn't just end at this farmland. And so he's got a lot of other uh, organizations and initiatives that are related to agriculture as well. So, you know, he's got Impossible Foods, which is um, making like plant based or um, artificial meat. He's got, uh, is it an Agco Investment Corp that essentially uh, partners? Actually, yeah, we'll just get to it in an article here. Um, but one thing that you may not realize is he also was involved in the global seed vault. And so this is maybe where we're going to accidentally get a little bit into conspiracy theory. But I think it's important to understand that Bill Gates is very focused on food as one of the primary investments that he's making here, even though we may not think of Bill Gates and food right away. I think a lot of people think of Bill Gates and medicine or Bill Gates and computers, right, or software. But the Norwegian government. And so 
This is what's interesting to me. Even in Wikipedia, it says the Norwegian government entirely funded the seed vaults, approximately 45 uh, million construction costs. Norway and the Corp Trust pay for operational costs, storing seeds in the vault uh, to free up its depositors. So on the surface there, that doesn't, it sounds like Bill Gates isn't involved in this whatsoever. But as you continue to like look a little bit deeper into Corp Trust, you'll find that this is Corp Trust here. And so just for perspective, um, you know, they've got 32,000 crop samples. Um, by CGIIAR, which um, is this entity. And just looking at the approximate value of the endowment fund, you know, $400 million. And when you go to look at who actually controls uh, crop trust, sorry, I said corp trust there earlier, that was a misread. Uh, when you're looking at who controls uh, crop trust, it, it starts to become more apparent that actually, oh, Bill Gates, um, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, as well as Monsanto and uh, Syngenta, are all involved in this organization. And that starts to make it feel a little bit less un -y, I guess, um, or less for all the people. So the so-called, uh, and this here is from the antimedia.com. So again, this is probably gonna be a slightly biased source. Uh, the so-called doomsday vault is owned and operated by Norway. However, the Norwegian government has no access to the content of any deposits, uh, which are kept in a chamber with a strictly maintained temperature of negative 18 Celsius. They are, hefti are uh, heftily barricaded to stave off cross-contamination. Seeds are the only material stored in these boxes. They are not shared or aggregated in any way. Each unit is strictly isolated to maintain exclusive access for the national account holder, according to the Guardian. And so, for example, like North Korea's rough wooden crates sit next door to deposits from the U.S., Russia's contributions on top of Ukraine's. Um, so, again, just wanted to kind of give a perspective of what is this seed vault anyways. Um, but understanding that, you know, this has been endorsed by the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. Since 2004, the Crop Trust has raised more than 410 million for the vaults and other seed banks. Norway, which paid for the vault, was the biggest donor, committing 45 million for that initial building of it, followed by America, Brits, and Australia, um, and the Gates Foundation. But I believe when we jump to this next one here, um, we'll see a slightly different breakdown. So uh, there's just a map, and this is just north of uh, Norway. The um, I like how it, it refers to the godforsaken island uh, of um, uh, Savard, right? Salvabard. Um, it's in that one. Uh, um, oh, what's that? The Golden Compass, I guess, in that book. But anyways, uh, this Doomsday Seed Bank, you know, um, and this is from Bibliotech uh, Appellades .net. So again, probably a little bit of a biased uh, source here, but um when viewing kind of what's going on in regards to even just like ownership of seeds right this is a really interesting idea the fact that you can actually own seeds or you could own like the trademarks or a patent on a certain genetic formulation of a seed when in the past it was just whoever had the seed could plant the seed um but uh so when you know, there was that quote there that I had from Henry Kissinger. If you control the oil, you control the country. If you control the food, you control the population. And so John H. Davis um, had been assistant agriculture secretary under President Dwight Eisenhower in the early 1950s. He left Washington in 1955 and went to the Harvard grad, uh, Graduate School of Business, an unusual place for an agricultural expert. In those days, he had a clear strategy. In 1956, uh, Davis wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review in which he declared that the only way to solve the so-called farm problem once and for all and avoid cumbersome government programs is to progress from agriculture to agribusiness. He knew precisely what he had in mind, though. Um, few others had a clue back then. A revolution in agriculture production that would concentrate control of the food chain in corporate multinational hands away from the traditional family farmer. A crucial aspect driving the interest of the Rockefeller Foundation and the U.S. agribusiness companies was the fact that the Green Revolution was based on proliferation of new hybrid seeds in developing markets. One vital aspect of hybrid seeds was their lack of reproductive capacity. So if you guys didn't realize, you know, um, genetically modified seeds, uh, they're literally genetically modified so that they can't reproduce or when you go and plant the seed of the seed, it won't be as productive as the original seed. Essentially, Think of it as, you know, how every business these days is trying to move towards monthly reoccurring revenue or subscription based revenue. Well, the giant chemical companies, which became giant seed companies, decided that they also would like that. Why would I want to sell you a seed once that you can reuse for the rest of your life when I could try and design a seed, patent it 
and then make sure that either that seed can't reproduce or if it can, that I can sue you in a court of law. And if if you guys haven't realized, this has been going on for a long time, particularly with uh, Monsanto. If you jump back, I think uh, CBC Marketplace did a series of uh, really interesting uh, videos or documentaries on you know Western farmers that I believe were using um, uh, genetically modified seeds for wheat. And the argument was Monsanto was suing a handful of these farmers. They claimed that they hadn't used Monsanto seeds, but the argument was it blown in from um, adjacent farmers' fields. Now, again, complicated situation. We're not going to be able to solve that in this discussion, but it is important to just keep that in the back of your mind that this battle over seeds um, has been going on for a while. But let me know if you think I'm getting a little bit too deep into the weeds here too, but I, I find this stuff really interesting. And I think that it even just helps frame how more important this likely is and how much more attention we should maybe be paying to it. Um, so unlike a uh, normal open uh, pollinated species whose seed gives yield similar to its parents, the yield of the seed borne by hybrid plants was significantly lower than that of first generation. That declining yield char characteristics of hybrid meant uh, farmers must normally buy seed every year in order to obtain high yields. Moreover, the low yield of the second generation eliminated the trade in seeds that was often done by seed producers without the breeder's authorization. It prevented the redistribution of commercial crop uh, seed by the middlemen. So again, it was just a way to essentially consolidate control over seeds. And so, oh, actually, I think that was a little bit out of place here, but uh, talking about that crop trust again, the crop trust has its office in Bonn, Germany after relocating from Rome, Italy. And so essentially the executive board is chaired by uh, Sir Peter Crane and the crop trust also has a donors council chaired by uh, Jap uh, Satter from the Netherlands. And the main donors include Australia, Canada, Germany, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, United Kingdom, United States and the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, the Gain Gains Research and Development Corporation. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and so a number of developing countries have also provided support, including Egypt, Ethiopia. Um, so just want to give that, but um, going in a slightly different direction here, this is from the off-guardian.org. So again, maybe a little biased source, maybe you want to double check it. Um, but Vadna Shiva is someone that's really speaking out against what she believes at least to be um, the accumulation of power when it comes to farms and seeds, seeds in particular, um, of Bill Gates and the Seed Vault and certain other um, large multinational organizations and companies like Monsanto and uh, Syngenta. Um, so in her latest report, uh, Reclaim the Seed, uh, Vandana uh, Shiva says, in the 1980s, the chemical corporation started to look at genetic engineering and patenting of seed as new sources of super profits. They took farmer varieties from the public gene banks, tinkered with the seed through conventional breeding or genetic engineering, and took patents. Shiva talks about the green revolution and seed colonialism. And there's a whole subject matter there to explore as well. We're just going to touch upon it here. But she says that uh, 768, 576 uh, ascensions of seeds were taken from farmers in Mexico alone. Taking the farmer seeds that embodies their creativity and knowledge of breeding, the civilizing mission of seed colonization is the declaration that farmers are primitive and the varieties they have bred are primitive, inferior, low yielding, and have to be substituted and replaced with superior seeds from a superior race of breeders, so-called modern varieties, and improved varieties bred for chemicals. So, you know, even some of the language here is framing it, obviously, in a very negative uh, connotation. But if you've looked at... Um, uh, there's a, an entire movement, right, of people looking for uh, heritage seeds. I think that's the right term, heritage seeds, and essentially wanting to get back to, you know, the way seeds originally worked or the way plants originally work. And again, that's not to say that there's no place for genetically modified um, seeds, but it is an interesting thought when you think about uh, a lot of Western corporations going in and convincing a lot of local farmers that their seeds are inferior. And so if you guys are interested, um, you can actually dive into her entire uh, book here, Reclaim the Seeds, um, and just kind of quickly going through it, you know, it, it explores a lot more what's going on at length. I'd encourage you guys to check it out if it's a, a particular interest to you. Um, but then let's move on to, um, again, the American conservative here. Um, there is, as Joel uh, Kotkin, America's uber geographer notes, uh, this is the age of neo-feudalism. So kind of returning back to that original definition of what we were talking about when we were saying landlords. Um, we are in a, in a, in a, oh my goodness, in a, 
I'm, I'm going to skip that word. Returning towards a more feudal era marked by gender concentration or by greater concentration of wealth and property, reduced upward mobility, demographic stagnation, and increased dogmatism. Uh, the gap between the serfs and the uh, aristocracy is growing at an alarming rate. The great land grabs are becoming more frequent and more sizable in nature. Um, who leads Gates Ag One? That was the company I was trying to think of. Okay, so in January last year, the Gates Foundation launched Gates Ag One, more commonly known as the Bill Melinda Gates Agricultural Innovations LLC. So who leads Gates Ag One? Uh, Joe Cornelius, once the director in, uh, for international development at Monsanto. Yes, that Monsanto, the company known for an awful uh, environmental record, a penchant for dangerous pesticides, and a history of legal battles with local farmers. Um, circling back to that uh, series that they did on Marketplace with uh, Canadian farmers. Its simple appearances can be deceiving. Gates is a man of many contradictions, an environmental activist with an annual carbon footprint of about uh, 7,493 metric tons, a benevolent vaccine uh, funder who refuses to share patent technology with the people most in need of the vaccines, a, a philanthropist who gives away billions yet appears to get richer with each year that passes. Um, so again, every one of these sources is a little bit biased uh, against Gates, but I think it is important to be thinking about these questions, exploring it, and also asking, what does he know that we don't know? Should I be following his his investment um, investment choices? And so uh, looking into essentially, you know, the principal funders and main funding channels in 2017 of the uh, uh, trust fund um, for that CGIIAR, um, we can see Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation by far is the largest uh, funder in that window three. So um, the hijacking, and this is from Regeneration International, the hijacking of farmer seeds is best highlighted with the shameful removal of India's preeminent rice research scientist, uh, Dr. R.H. Richaria. As the, as the head of India's Central Rice Research Institute in uh, Kadak, Orissa, um, which housed the largest collection of rice diversity in the world for refusing to allow the IRRI in the Philippines to pirate the collection out of India. With his removal at the behest of the World Bank, Indian peasant intellectual property was hijacked by the IRR, IRRI in the Philippines, which later became part of the newly created uh, Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research, which is the CGIAR organization. So farmer seed heritage was held in the private seed banks of CGIAR, a consortium of 15 international agricultural research centers controlled by the World Bank, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, as well as, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which since 2003 has poured more than 720 million into its centers. And um, the gene banks presently manage 768,576 ascension of farmer seeds. Taken together, uh, the gene bank represents the largest and most widely used collection of crop diversity in the world. So the Bill and Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation operates a bit like the World Bank, using its financial power and prowess to take control of agriculture and influence government and institutional agricultural policies. By far, the largest funder is Gates and has successfully accelerated the transfer of research and seeds from scientific research institutions to commodity-based corporations, centralizing and facilitating the pirating of intellectual property and seed monopolies through intellectual property laws and seed regulations. So again, there's a lot to explore in here. And if you guys are interested, I, I, I encourage you to go down the deep rabbit hole. Um, so one thing I just kind of want to put into perspective, because it can be easy for us to forget these things, Monsanto, that, that giant seed company, agricultural business, uh, it, it used to be a chemical business, right? Um, so uh, this is from, I don't even know, goofball citizen, but you may be asking yourself, what is Monsanto? Well, have you ever uh, seen or used Roundup? They make it, and today they are one of the world's largest pesticide producers while aggressively expanding their GMO crops, which is an acronym for genetically modified organism. Uh, they have a century-long history of making products that neither help man or his environment with such infamous additions as uh, saccharin and uh, aspartame, um, RBGH, RBST, growth hormones, DDT, PCBs, and, um, you know, from the Vietnam War, or war Agent Orange, which was, um, I mean, yeah, go Google Agent Orange if you want to see what a terrible thing that was. Um, but essentially, you know, from 1901 to 1997, 100 years, they were a chemical conglomerate and are now 100% agricultural. And so they've definitely made moves to reposition themselves and uh, 
position themselves in a much more uh, public facing friendly manner. Uh, Agent Orange wouldn't be very popular these days. Um, but then uh, continuing on kind of the Bill Gates and just what he owns, I think another layer that you'll often hear people that are concerned long term about individual property rights ownerships is the World Economic Forum. And so we're going to explore that a little bit here. And then I promise we're going to circle all back to real estate investing. Just hang, hang in there, kitten, for a little bit longer. Um, in terms of individual landowners, Gates is uh, still far behind media mogul John C. Malone. So we're talking total land here, not farmland, who is on top spot with 2.2 million acres of ranches and forests and CNN founder Ted Turner, who owns about 2 million acres of ranch land. Amazon's Jeff Bezos is also investing in land on a large scale, according to the report. Um, so what billionaire philanthropists and technocrats are acquiring land um, at an accelerating speed, they appear to be telling the general public that in the future, private property will virtually cease to exist. So in his book, uh, World Economic Forum founder and globalist uh, Klaus Schwab uh, makes clear that the fourth industrial revolution or the Great Reset will lead to the abolition of uh, private property. And so that message is echoed in some of the WEF's official websites, as well as on some of their social media posts back in 2016. And so there's that infamous quote that you've probably seen on Twitter that says, welcome to the year 2030, welcome to my city, or should I say our city? I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. And I've never been happier, essentially, is the common theme there. Now, even that's a little bit more complicated, right? So if we uh, jump back to... Uh, routers here for a fact check, um, you'll find that this was fact checked as false because they don't, oftentimes what people claim is that the World Economic Forum has a direct mandate to you know abolish private property. They don't have a direct mandate. They just, they're kind of talking between, they're expecting us to read between the lines there. They're like, you'll probably own nothing and you'll probably like it. But they're like, yeah, it's probably gonna happen. Um, so anyways, essentially where a lot of people point to this and where it often goes viral is WEF's uh, social media video from 2016 that stated eight predictions about the world in 2030, including you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. What you want, you'll rent and it'll be delivered by drone. Um, but again, there's two sides to this story where when we look at the actual book he wrote, The Great Reset, um, you know, it, it does talk about that fourth industrial revolution, right? Or the abolishing of private property. So while the WEF doesn't have a direct mandate for it, it seems like a lot of individuals actively involved with it, um, both past and present, lean that way, lean towards the idea that private property should be phased out. And yet what's interesting is a lot of the technocrats that influence and go to like the Davos summit, um, they seem to be acquiring a lot of land. So it's one of those things where they're saying, do as I say, don't do as I do. Don't worry about what I'm doing. You should just stop owning things. Or at least I think it's really easy for us to interpret it that way. So what should we make of all this? Is there even a point to Matt rambling on here? Well, going back to what my dad told me, they're not really making a lot more land. However, I think one thing that we should always be aware of is, again, that ownership of that land is only as strong as your ability to enforce it. So when we've got strong institutions and strong individual freedoms, there's probably a high probability that you're going to be allowed to own land for a long time. And that probably means it's a good investment if the past is any indicator of the future. But again, when we take a step back and look at it more abstractly, well, land is also just kind of one of the means of production, right? And one of the most important means of production when we're talking about farmland because it's our food. And so it, it seems natural that powerful individuals would want to accumulate things that would give them more power. But what is interesting, when you look at Bill Gates owning hundreds of thousands of acres of land when he's really deeply invested and connected with some of the largest corporations that control a lot of the genetic patents on these uh, hybrid seeds or GMO seeds, and then also is involved with the seed bank, it seems like regardless of whether you want to give nefarious or you know the best of intentions to Bill Gates, he clearly thinks this is very important. He's clearly spent a lot of his time and energy on that. And so I think us as real estate investors, if anything should be taken away from this is, yeah, real estate is a solid investment, but we should keep our eyes on the horizon because I, I am long-term concerned about some of our um, more socialist oriented leaders here in Canada. And I think you can pick just about any Western democracy and find a similar reason for concern that landlords are positioned often in the media as evil, greedy, bad people. 
And again, like anything, there's two sides to every story. That's clearly an oversimplification. But what we should also be aware of is that us small guys, we're more likely to get crushed than Bill Gates. So while Bill Gates may get a headline or two about how you know people are angry that he's starting his own neo-feudalism or that he owns so much land along with his billionaire buddies, um, bigger thing for us to really be aware of is keeping our eyes on regulation, making sure that we're letting people know that like, no, I think that landlords, that small landholders, they're a good thing. I think that I know that the vast majority of real estate investors I've met, they're directly investing in their communities and they're making properties and the assets they acquire better. And they're creating better amenities, they're upgrading things, and there's a lot of value they're generating. Now, when you get into um, you know, economic debates, like uh, when you explore Adam Smith's thought on um, you know, land ownership, and especially when we're talking more like raw land or farmland, that's where the question of like, are you really improving it comes into play. And that's where a lot of critiques on owning, especially raw land, but even to a lesser extent, farmland get interesting. I don't have a solution. I know one thing for sure. I've got no intentions on, on selling the family farm. I definitely would love to see it stay for another century in the McKeever name if possible. But I do think a lot more small farm landowners are going to get squeezed out. Again, it's not just billionaires that are acquiring it. There's also, you know, deck of millionaires that are acquiring it. In my, um, near my hometown, you know, there's a really large uh, uh, contracting business. And one of the things that was interesting growing up is this contracting business started getting into the business of acquiring land. And I can remember at first not really understanding why he's buying farmland when his contracting business seemed to do so well. And, you know, growing dozens of employees, then I think hundreds of employees. And he just kept buying more and more farmland until he's one of the largest farmland owners, at least our little corner of the county that I grew up in. In fact, like we're almost circled now by... Uh, his land ownership to a certain degree, um, us and a handful of other small uh, farming families. But, you know, when you take a step back, there was very clear business incentives for him to want to do that. One, the debt on farmland is really cheap normally. Um, and there's a lot of incentives, right? So um, FCC here in Canada, Farm Credit Canada, and other organizations really help try and facilitate farmland ownership. But then beyond that, farmland, because its historical returns, as well as its protection from inflation and volatility, it naturally draws the desire um, to be used for collateral. And that's in fact what was really um, pushing this uh, business owner into acquiring farmland was he was able to acquire that cheap debt. And then as inflation did its thing and he gained equity, he was able to tap that equity as collateral for large projects when he's bidding, because when you're bidding on you know million dollar or tens of millions of dollar construction projects, you actually oftentimes have to put up a bond or collateral um, or put up collateral to the like the insurance or bond company in order to assure everyone that you're not just going to screw this project up. And so I suspect a lot of us real estate investors should maybe be sharpening our pencils and thinking about looking into farmland. Is there an opportunity here for us to be able to leverage it or tap it for maybe second or third mortgages? And it's just going to be a cheap source of debt that we can also use as an inflation hedge while still being a productive asset. Because one of the things about sitting on a million dollars in cash is it does jack all for you. We're sitting on a million dollars in farmland, you can at least rent it out. Now, you know what you're gonna rent that farmland out for may or may not cover your carrying costs, but it's at least gonna cut into your carrying costs on it. And when we're looking at that 11% historical return over the last 30 years, it's pretty easy to see why a lot of business owners, whether they're deck of millionaires or billionaires or just massive corporations want to acquire land. As long as you're allowed to own land, it's probably going to be a wise investment, particularly if it's productive land or land that you can turn into being productive. So appreciate you guys holding on for this ride for 50 minutes. If you guys enjoyed this video, please smash the like button, hit subscribe. Let me know in the comment section, did any of this make sense? Did I hopefully provide some value to you? What's your perspective on all this as well? I'd love to hear in the comments. So let me know. Do you think is farmland a great investment? Is farmland a terrible investment? Do you think Bill Gates is a genius in general? Do you think he's a genius for buying farmland? Do you think he's an evil genius for buying farmland? I'd, I'd love to know your perspective. And are you thinking about buying farmland? Um, I know that buying it just for the sake of buying it, part of my ego wants to own farmland, but even more so I, I for anything that I'm going to acquire, it needs to make financial sense day one. And so, you know what? 
I probably should go back, sharpen my own pencil and think a little bit more about creative ways to be able to finance and leverage and use farmland to my advantage because throughout history, from the Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire to the medieval era to today, owning land usually works out in your favor again, as long as you can enforce the property rights. So we'll see you guys in the next video. Let me know any other thoughts for future videos that you'd like us to do a deep dive on in the comment section. Appreciate you guys. We'll see you in the next video.